Okay, I want to welcome to the Agents of Innovation podcast, Marcin Jakubowski. Uh, of course, uh, with that name, you can tell that's a Polish name, uh, Marcin Jakubowski. And uh, he was born in Poland, came over to the United States as a kid, and he is now the founder and executive director of Open Source Ecology, has a PhD in fusion energy. Marcin, welcome to the Agents of Innovation podcast. Glad to be here. Thank you, Francisco. Well, Marcin, uh, we are glad to have you as well. And I find it interesting, your story coming from Poland as a child. Uh, it was in the early 1980s, right? Tell us a little bit more about what it was yeah. like to, to grow up in Poland. Yeah, so 1982, that was still the time of the Berlin Wall before the collapse. So it was a great communist country. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a little rough. You, you'd have to wait in line for food during that time. And uh, you can, when you live in Poland, you, you also have the history of the Second World War. With you, so like for example, my grandmother was in a concentration camp. My grandfather was in the Polish underground, derailing German supply trains and things like that. So wow. that culture of of deprivation, um, yeah, I've seen some of that, and that definitely influenced my outlook on open source or open collaborative <laughs> development. Yeah, I mean, because uh, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Very closed economy there in Poland at the time, and yeah. uh, uh, this part of one of the Soviet states at the time. Uh, well, it's interesting, Marcin, because you came now, you all migrated from Poland mm -hmm. to, uh, was it New Jersey? Yeah, New Jersey, Newark, uh, graffiti ridden streets of Newark. It wasn't, the streets weren't paved with gold like we, we would think. But yeah, I lived in Patterson, New Jersey. Then there was actually a hotel fire there that we survived. It was actually a bunch of deaths there, like 14 people died in that. Wow. But, you uh, were in the hotel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of those things where at that time, so I was, I guess, 11 and really thought, okay, what's meaningful in life? Like, because we, we were waiting up on the eighth floor of this building for like wow. an, hours until we were rescued. And that was one of those near, near death experiences where you kind of think like through that and after that, like, wow, what is really important, you know? So you came with your parents. Uh, yeah. Did you have any siblings? Yeah, my from... brother, my parents. So we moved to Kearney, New Jersey, uh, went to Kearney High School, then went to Princeton University undergrad, and then University of Wisconsin grad for the Fusion PhD. Yeah. Wow. So um, very interesting. So as a, as a kid, or when was, your, when's the, when was the first job you ever had? When was that? I had a paper route since sixth grade through elementary high school and college I actually kept that in college so it was more like 10 years of that so that was a thing i always kind of had money uh, lying around so I, that wasn't an issue uh just because i was working myself and yeah so that was first job but different than what i'm pursuing today <laughs> you know it's interesting i i don't i don't know what what so cause i it, it's like i've had a lot of i've had a lot of guests on the agents of innovation podcast where i asked them what their first job was I've actually had quite a few people that have had a paper route, Interesting. and I don't know what I don't know what that's about because I feel like in the year 2020, uh, hmm. a young person right now probably won't even know what a paper route is. Huh? Interesting. Uh, and it, and yeah. it wasn't that long ago. I mean, we're not that old, so yeah. come on. Uh, but anyway, um, I just find that very interesting. Well, what what was one of some of the things you learned from from that first job that maybe you took with you into into the rest of your life? Um, I think efficiency is actually one of them because. After doing a paper out for so long, it's like you get really efficient at it and learn how to cut corners, not cut corners, but really do it efficiently and fast. So I think the insights of efficiency as an economic principle, I think that's definitely relevant in what I do today. And in fact, like if you talk about, you know, one country being prosperous and another not so, what is it? It's about the operating systems, the governance but also part of that is how things are done, efficiencies. That's definitely critical to a modern standard of living that we have today. So yeah. you graduated from the University of Wisconsin with a PhD yeah. in fusion energy. Yeah. What was your next steps after college? So, yeah, so right after that, uh, pretty much took to the land. So the farther I went in my education, the, the more useless I was feeling in terms of solving pressing world issues. So uh, thinking about, at that point, I actually started to think about ideas of collaboration, open collaboration, because in my PhD program, I wasn't able to talk openly, for example, about my work, which made me question this whole system of how we, we operate, even if at the public institution, you can't really talk openly about what you're doing, how must that be throughout the rest of society? So some, somebody introduced me to Linux back in my group, the open source software system, and the, the insight for me was 
it's like wow okay there's different ways to do things there's there's uh, different options of how you can do different things and given that science wasn't doing it for me I said okay let's do an experiment of what a truly collaborative system would look like so started open source ecology right after I uh, finished grad school with the notion of uh, how do you make the world better for everybody because in my PhD program I felt no I wasn't doing it and we're studying such theoretical things that um, made me really question what I was doing and completely switched and got onto a raw piece of land after that and started the project. Well, let's go back to that time in, in uh, grad school where you yeah. said you weren't uh, able to openly talk about some things and what yeah. was that because I don't know the site, you know, tell us well, to, to, to people, who, uh, those of us who aren't exactly scientists, what, does what, that is, mean? what was it that was kind of controversial to talk about? Oh yeah, well, it was just our subject matter of the research. So we were doing fusion energy, we were studying turbulence and fusion tokamaks and so forth. So there's research. I have no idea what that means. Yeah, it's it's basically <laughs> about how do you how do you create a sun on the earth so how do okay. you har harvest the create the energy the fusion reaction just like on a sun how do you do that on earth and how do you do that in a way that you can trap the energy well we had some insights about oh well how that how the the turbulence process in one of these reactors would look like it's just getting deep into the details of that turbulence in these reactors but because we had some cutting edge material i was not able to simply talk about what i was doing in detail to anybody because they might take that idea publish it and we'd be cut out of grants and whatever so that kind of Got competitive you. environment was there and now that's one side that influenced my thinking but also on the other side it's like when you get to grad school you start talking a lot about theoretical stuff and it was certainly the case with fusion and one time I went to a professor asking what's this long equation mean and he said well it just actually doesn't mean anything I just made it up so this crazy stuff where you're studying stuff that doesn't even exist what, when there are real problems on a planet, that wasn't right to me, and that's, that influenced my thinking a lot. Yeah, that's, you know, that's interesting because th there definitely is that kind of contradiction in some ways in, in education is, is how practical is it, right? I mean, uh, yeah. to be used rather than just learning for learning's sake. It, or... well, well, yeah, so I came from Poland, and I, I came to America, an incredibly prosperous country, and I, I thought, well, why does it have to be like one country is completely deprived and another is absolutely prosperous? How does that happen? How can we use all that knowledge that we have to make everybody's life better? And that was the contradiction I ran into, seeing that, well, no, it's the way we're studying things and, you know, going into this abstract theoretical studies, it's that's not where it's at yeah so okay so then you took to the land uh, <laughs> yeah. uh and you started a farm right yeah started a farm in missouri so that was when i learned so so back in the phd since i was somewhat alienated from my program i started to study all this alternative stuff and open you know not open source but agriculture permaculture renewable energy and all these progressive topics of how you could achieve prosperity for everybody uh, Buckminster Fuller and all this this kind of stuff appropriate technology and then when I got to the land I found that wow that was all books that was still didn't do it I, we were basically pretty much annihilated by weeds that grew and equipment that broke down and that's the story actually with the tractor that broke down and uh, so I found that okay mm. on one side you don't have access to appropriate long life equipment two I didn't have any really practical skills uh, I read all the books, but I was completely unprepared for what was to come. <laughs> so, uh, why did you start the farm? I mean, is that something that a typical PhD in fusion <laughs> energy does, start a farm? No, that's rather the exception. But the idea there was, if you're going to try... So, I was thinking about the big picture of things. What would society look like in a framework where everybody o collaborated openly? There were no such things as patents. Like in academia, you'd be working on real meaningful problems and all that. So... Uh, to start think, start actually beyond thinking, doing something about it. Well, you got to start with okay, how do we live and survive? So that means okay, land. There's housing. There's agriculture. Agriculture is like the first thing that you got to feed yourself. And how do you then build up technology? So start thinking about uh, what a better civilization would look like. So naturally, to for any civilization reboot experiment, you're going to need some land. So that's what I did. Got the land and started experimenting. 
Great. And then uh, I guess you had, I know you had some issues there. You talked about the tractor breaking down and, and, and other things. And, and that led you to, yeah. uh, to, to start investigating appropriate technology in a, in a real yeah. significant way. So that problem was, okay, so I got a tractor, then it broke, old tractor broke, paid to get it repaired, then it broke again. Pretty soon I was broke too, as I say in my TED talk, and by the way, which is a good four minute introduction to the whole project if you want to take a look at that. So if, but, you, if somebody just goes to the TED.com and just searches your name, yeah. Marcy Jakubowski. Jack, yeah, that, search that for the will... Global Global Village Construction Set Open Source Blueprints for Civilization. So that's the kind of work that this led into was, okay, if that's a problem that I had, I'm sure I wasn't alone in this, and it must be persistent. So I decided, well, let's see, if I'm going to solve this problem for myself by actually starting to build my own equipment, building in my own machines, then uh, I can solve the problem for everybody. So now getting into the entrepreneurial spirit, okay, here's a problem. Um, I didn't really look at it as, as the entrepreneurial scheme because I, I kind of... Uh, came at it more from this is kind of like fire in my pants I need some things like right now um, which is somewhat entrepreneurial but wasn't driven by this thinking the business thinking saying okay now I've got a problem we're gonna solve it here's a solution here's the value proposition that's that came later uh, and I certainly think of like that r more more like that right now but at that time it was, it was about solving a pressing need for myself and and others through um, build actually really building tractors for others Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, how did that experience lead you to starting open source ecology? Yeah. So, uh, more like that, that started me on the idea of the global village construction set saying, okay, well, what are the, some of the most critical infrastructure building machines and tools that we all need to have the modern standard that we live with? Everything from your tractors to your bread baking oven, to circuit making, to everything that that our society revolves on energy and everything else so i said well let's let's take a stab at identifying some of the most critical critical machines and open sourcing them so that anybody who wants to build a sustainable farm sustainable community or even bootstrap an entire economy from 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 the ground up can do so readily and that that is a powerful idea it relates to leapfrogging in the developing world. It re revolves around prosperity in a country like ours, where we still have the fourth world. You know, we've got our impoverished areas aplenty in this country. Uh, so what could we do with, uh, with making technology accessible to the, the common man, especially like that you can repair the things? Because if you right. don't, can't repair something, you don't really own it. Yeah. yeah, you know, so right now, I mean, we kind of live in a world where we buy a lot of products that do things for us. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, we're even moving to a world with a lot of AI. That's, yep. that's you know, um, we may all have robots walking around soon or taking care of our every need. But how that seems to stand in contrast to what you're suggesting. But tell me what, uh, you know, that maybe people become a little more technically technical uh, yeah. savvy, if you will. No, it's, it's actually not a contradiction. Uh, I mean, robots already serve us, like, for example, a robotic vacuum cleaner in this house. Mm -hmm. But no, the idea is that uh, part of the Global Village construction set is automation and computer numerical controlled fabrication, 3D printers, industrial robots. I mean, that's all in there. It's just about making the technology accessible to everybody. So actually right now, if you talk about artificial intelligence or computer vision, CV, AI, I mean, all of that is actually open source. A lot of that content is open source. So we can certainly apply that and use it in a good way. I mean, that's that's always the key. Any powerful technology you can use towards our benefit or towards our demise. Yeah. Anyway. So speaking practically, you know, in this current time of the, the world going through this COVID-19 pandemic, I've seen a lot of movement of people, people mm -hmm. deciding... I mean, a lot of people in New York City, for example, just say, yeah. boy, I've had to deal with this in a city lockdown. I'm getting out. I'm going to another state or I'm going or maybe even somebody in another state that's in a city. I know some people in South Florida, for example, mm. who are saying, hey, I'm going to move to the country in North Florida yeah. and I'm going to start a farm or I'm going to just live a, a little more self-sustaining lifestyle so I don't have to be dependent on other people or have to worry about you know, a lockdown or this or that, or a job, corporate office, whatever. 
people yeah. are making a lot of uh, changes right now. And somebody listening might say, hey, I kind of like this uh, idea of building my own sustainable home and community. Uh, to, what, what are you seeing out there and how can someone go about doing it? What would be their first steps? Yeah, so actually right now, the question about supply chains definitely comes up a lot. The idea of what it takes to have a resilient economy, like because we've seen a lot of perhaps failure in this country and elsewhere on that. So people are thinking about this. The first step is, I mean, get involved in this. So, I mean, it's a mind shift to simply say that you can actually do all this stuff. Like, for example, when I first built the tractor, it's like you, at first you, you're, you look at it and it's like, wow, that's impossible. But then you start breaking things down and you say, well, a tractor is literally, okay, it's this frame, this box with wheels, there's a power unit and so forth. So first you have to recognize that this is within human capacity and that a lot of times the things we use are such black boxes and the way people design things are all wrapped up and you can't even mess with it. So we're indoctrinated to think that, oh, this is like some engineer or crazy scientist did this and it's not us. But I believe that true democracy relies on people being much more aware about more in control of their technology base so that you can have the flexibility and not the dependence that you can. So first it's a it's a mind shift. But then once you recognize it, you can you can see that, oh, well, definitely people can build their own home. They can even build a tractor in one day. We've shown that. I mean, we've shown how you can take 12 people. And in one day, you can build one of our tractors. So wow. it's we've seen some amazing results with this. The technology works. That's that's one of the biggest learnings on my side. And and it's really about uh, my goal is to communicate that to others to show that hey, we can be building the things around us. We are not imprisoned to whatever somebody else offers us. And I think we see that with the mass customization, with things like three D printing and and robotics. Uh, uh, small scale fabrication being accessible to more people that's definitely the case so the, really it's it's about switching your mindset to that of a from from a consumer kind of a mindset to a producer to a creator mindset that's the key but other than that you can you can go onto our our website and download some plans you can start building 3d printers you can build the tractor we offer uh, immersion workshops where we can teach you how to do that in weekend workshops or other immersion training. What is the website? OpenSourceEcology.org. So you can take a look o at that. OpenSourceEcology.org. And uh -huh. I think on the website you've identified about 50 machines. Yep. yep. And so, yeah, exactly. So the, the Global Village construction set is, is exactly the 50 machines that we thought were the most important, most inaccessible, most expensive, just for all the fundamental uh, things that we do in society and we did that as one is okay so you can wrap your head around these 50 things but second it's about developing a methodology where you can do collaborative development so beyond just the idea that oh I have these 50 machines that's not enough because new technology is not going to save you it's it's a mental shift maybe a cultural shift will save you it's and it's about uh, one learning to collaborate how do you collaborate effectively on uh, problems that are bigger than ourselves. Like right now with the COVID, for example, we've seen how, okay, um, how well do we know how to collaborate? That's, and that, I asked myself that question and I found for myself even that, well, we better develop effective ways that people can work together. And that starts with, once again, the awareness that that's possible. But we're very much conditioned to think that is not the case. Just look at patents, the idea that, oh, you got to take that, patent it, hide it, don't share it with anybody. We're really indoctrinated to a lot of kind of uh, individualistic or non-collaborative thought patterns I think are the biggest thing. So while we develop the 50 machines, we also develop the mindsets and the collaboration techniques with which people can use to apply to any problem. So, yeah, getting back to the title of your company, Open Source Ecology. Yeah. Uh, can you define o the idea of open source for our audience? Yeah. Uh, because I think you kind of mentioned there about you know, like yeah. you said, a patent is something you maybe kind of hide, but some open source, uh, it's yeah. kind of more open to more people, right? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, open source refer comes from the world of open source software, and, and we're translating that same concept into hardware. But in open source software, what that simply means is that the blueprints, the source code, like if you have a program, program programming 
whatever, like the web browser you use. That's right. a program, right? Uh, if it's open source, you can actually take the code and look at it and examine what it does. So the four freedoms of open source means that you can inspect it, you can use it, you can copy it, and you can sell it, actually. Uh, which the last one is actually very important because without that, you wouldn't be able to incentivize people to collaborate. Like, you want to work on um, economically significant products. So for hardware, it means that the blueprints, like for example, for the tractor, we're publishing the blueprints. We have an open collaborative process that uses the wiki, just like Wikipedia. You can edit that openly. You can contribute, uh, and anyone can download, examine, make, modify, and build to sell our tractors, our brick press, our 3D printers, our houses. Yeah, that's great. So um, you gave that TED talk in 2010. 2011, and, yeah. uh, or 2011, you gave the TED Talk in 2011, yep. and then you met your wife in 2012? Yeah, yeah, I met my wife. So we actually started a, a project together here as well. So she's also another open hardware advocate, advocate Katerina Mota. Uh, so we're working on the Open Building Institute. We did a Kickstarter on that in 2016, actually, because uh, one of the things she found when she moved out here was that she needed some more space and a comfortable house to live in, uh, more than uh, the male comforts. So uh, she actually started a, a program open building institute a project to make affordable ecological housing widely accessible so that's a collaboration that's definitely a great project that we're we're actually bringing that up again i can talk about that if you like yeah so that's the uh open building institute is that yeah right? yeah a good website for the concept is openbuildinginstitute.org but basically the concept of modular housing that you can build uh, like Legos, using panel construction that you can you can build with a small small team of people and then assemble it rapidly into place. It's actually the house I live in right now here. It's a 1,400 square foot house. It's it's uh, design from the Open Building Institute, and it, we build that with 50 people in five days. So once again, the concept is uh, so 50 people five days. Idea 50 that people got together and built a, a 1,400 square foot home in five days. Five days. How do you do wow. that? So what does that home en encompass? What do you what do you have in the home? I mean, how, how many rooms and uh, it's, it's, what's the plumbing like? So it's uh, an off-grid eco home. So we've got photovoltaics. We're actually connected to the grid. We've got a pellet stove, hydronics, I mean, regular kitchen, bathroom. We actually have a biodigester in here for processing waste and it's off-grid capable. Uh, has water collection. You can actually look at the full design. So it's that's at the. Uh, I can send you a link for the seat. So here in home. Florida, we would be concerned with air conditioning. How's the air and heating system there? Yeah, we've got an air conditioner, so we run that most of the time on a solar energy. But wow. the idea being, I mean, just the concept. It's important. The idea that in a modular design, you can have a lot of different modules that are that a large team can work together on each module and then assemble it rapidly into place. That's the kind of concept we're, we're developing. We call that extreme manufacturing, where you can have these rapid builds that are not only productive, but also social. So you can get, get together with a bunch of people. We offer these kinds of events as workshops. And actually, I want to say that right now, so this is pretty exciting, but we're going to look at uh, taking this kind of a house model, uh, create a package where you can have a thousand square foot house that you can build by yourself with a friend in one week for $50,000. That's our next goal. Wow. And we're doing that in order to do that, we're gonna create this very big collaborative design event, which we are calling Extreme Enterprise uh, to pull that off. So actually gathering 2,000 people in a, in a remote collaborative event, very well scripted out for as far as what all the development points are modular breakdown so this is our next experiment it's going to actually happen in, in about uh next summer we're planning this wow. for but basically to take all the stuff all the prototypes we've done and all the documentation to refine it and turn that into a viable business model so this really gets into this enterprise aspect because one of the things we found is one of the challenges of open source hardware is where's the product it takes a lot a lot of effort it's like a thousand times harder than software you've got real infrastructures and real materials you're working with and people and budgets and materials but that's the next goal yeah so tell me uh you're in missouri how far yeah. are you from what's like the closest major city kansas city is just an hour away just an hour away so, yeah. you, so you're there and 
and the sort of lifestyle you live there uh, with this home that you built, is yeah. this, are you totally self-sustaining? I mean, we talked about supply chains. Do you go to, I mean, what do you, what do you uh, sort of consume? And Yeah. And, uh, I mean, right now until we build all the machines, no, I mean, we buy our stuff at the big box store still. I mean, all the materials, like say for the tractor, you go to the steel supply and hydraulics supplies and all that. But once you get deeper into the system, once you have the precision machining to machine metal, you could be making your own engines and then you be making your own biofuels or hydrogen or whatever. So the idea of the Global Village construction set is there's also machines to turn uh, literally like the dirt and twigs under your feet into modern materials. So things like taking scrap steel and melting it down and rolling it into virgin steel or even the last last uh, last machine in the set actually for, for your information is the aluminum extraction from clay. So you take in clay, which is aluminosilicate, and you're actually extracting aluminum from that. Can that be done? Yes, if you have the energy and, and the technology to do it. So that's an example to show that, okay, even with very common substances, you can get to this advanced civilization. And that's kind of the one of the points, yeah. to show the limits of what's possible. So, Martin, uh, if someone uh, wants to learn a little bit more, you said you have some... Uh, sort of seminars online or what is yeah. it some workshops i'd say uh so first thing take a look at the the ted talk and then take a look at the workshops that we offer so we've got immersion training you can definitely surf our wiki there's a bunch of materials there a uh, good page to to look at is getting involved how you can get involved so we list all the workshops and immersion training so right now we're actually starting an immersion training program for people to start chapters of open source ecology in different locations so right now we've pretty much figured out how to do workshops and product sales as a revenue model. So for example, right now you can buy our 3D printers. Uh, that's that's all we pretty much have right now. But then moving on to other machines and then further on selling the tractors and other things. But we're we're starting to sell products and do the workshops, and that's a viable revenue model that we've documented that we can now spin off other branches in different locations. So if you want to get super ambitious about getting involved, take a look at that program. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, uh, speaking of collaborating, are there any other like organizations, maybe some charitable organizations that you've worked with? Like I could think of like, yeah, uh, like a Habitat for <clears throat> Humanity or something really benefiting from this model. Yeah, we're going to hook up with the Habitat for Humanity for the housing project right now. But no, we haven't had too much. I guess we were we we're doing just a lot of prototyping and a lot of proof of concept. I think as we go forward, we're going to do more of that. There's also, for example, OSE Germany that started, and they're doing some of their projects there. Uh, so that's actually a good good step forward. But yeah, definitely, uh, we can definitely walk the walk by collaborating more with others. But it's very interesting that it's it's hard to find people that do want to collaborate openly. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of times we go about, like somebody asks us, okay, I want to collaborate on your tractor. Oh yeah, except I'm completely proprietary, and I'm going to suck this all up once you <laughs> once we develop it. I mean, you have cases like that. A lot of times people just come to this and they don't really see that this is open source for everybody's uh, benefit. Mm. And then a lot of people are pushed pushed off by that. But that's not the point. Yeah. So what what have been some of your biggest challenges along the yeah. way and through this? Oh, uh, well, I would actually identify that as collaborative literacy. The idea of how people work together or not know how to work together. Um, first, Ooh. the idea that, I mean, if you think about it, you know, take take tractors as a good example. Wouldn't it be better if all the companies, uh, like hundreds or thousands of them, or cordless drills, hundreds or thousands of companies that make them would collaborate together, come up with the best product that just kills it, that's the best in the marketplace. Well, instead you've got a whole bunch of them, a bunch of different ones. Most of them are in fear. There's one like really good one, like say Apple or whatever. Uh, but think about this. Um, it doesn't take much to think that if we all collaborated, we would just knock out the problems to get the best products and then move on to solving bigger issues, like bigger societal issues, like poverty and crime or whatever. Uh, so what do you that think? Doesn't happen. That? And that's that's cultural. That, I think, right. is the biggest block. People do not see that, that the pie is big enough for everybody and then we could all benefit by doing that. That, I think, is the number one challenge that we face. Yeah. So... Uh... What have you um, kind of learned the most through all of this? Oh, yeah. I, I would say the first thing is that there's a big difference between vision and execution. I guess back down to good old enterprise. 
you know, starting the project idealistically, I thought that, oh yeah, once we publish the first thing, this is going to go crazy and sprout all over the world. Like 2008, when we did the first brick press, thought that would just go wild across the globe. But no, how many people are actually building it for a business? Nobody. Uh, it's, it's, there's a huge difference between a working prototype uh, or something that's near product and actual execution to the kind of scale that we talk about because we still talk about uh, changing the world, the next trillion dollar economy as the open source economy, uh, the paradigm shift towards collaborative development. That's our big game. Uh, now that takes millions and billions and trillions of effort down the road to make it happen and that is enterprise. It's marketing, it's execution, uh, and it's building up the skill set to do that. So personally I have my biggest learning is that I need to build up a skill set for the enterprise side and that's what I'm doing. That's great. Well, uh, this has been uh, uh, really great to learn about. Uh, I mean, almost mind blowing in some ways. I think there's probably a lot of people listening like myself to you. And as I was studying a little bit about what you were up to, like, wow, this is like just something I've never really considered um, yeah. uh, to this degree. I mean, that you're you're doing and uh, uh, what would you also say in this, you know, uh, what can you say to other entrepreneurs out there, no matter what field they're in, on, on the kind of kind of just some some general entrepreneurial <laughs> yeah. advice? I'll, I'll say this: the sun shines at the earth ten thousand times more power than we currently use. From first principles, there's an absolute case for abundance, and now we have big problems facing the world. So to solve them, collaborate. I mean, work with others to not just your project but open that up to say to pick a bigger problem and work with others to solve it that's the way we're going to get through this world to make a, a better future tomorrow so we cannot be going up about our individual projects even like and i'm talking about even a google or an apple no i'm talking bigger than that i'm talking about paradigm shift so so uh think stop and think deeply about what it really means to collaborate and solve and cho then choose to solve bigger problems that people don't even want to talk about. Let's be very deliberate about, ta about tackling them. But for that, you have to collaborate and really open your up yourself to that. Well, uh, we're all about that here at the Agents of Innovation podcast. In fact, uh, the yeah. main reason I started this podcast about five years ago was because through a lot of the different things I was doing in my work and people I was meeting, I just kept hearing these really incredible entrepreneurial stories and wanted to share them with more people. And at the same time, yeah. I was just, I was also becoming a podcast listener yeah. and thought, hey, why not start a podcast where I can bring stories like, like yourself uh, to more people so they can get uh, to know you and learn about what you're yeah. doing, learn about your stories and then connect with you. Uh, so they can do that again at what, opensourceecology.org? Yep, opensourceecology.org. And also in the show notes here, uh, you know, we'll put some of that information and also there's a blog post that we'll put up at agentsofinnovation.org. Uh, so we'll have all, all the links to your TED Talks and everything, and people can get to know you and hopefully uh, connect with you. But uh, March and I, we're really just uh, uh, happy to have you on, and yeah. I'll just let you let you uh, leave us with any uh, last closing thoughts. Yeah, collaborate. Open up and collaborate. Like, um, And selfishly speaking here, it's like, look at some of our stuff. I guess one idea I didn't really touch on is the idea of distributive enterprise the idea that like for example with the 3d printers that we're selling right now we're actively teaching others how to build them and produce them as an enterprise so think about that when you when you go forth in your business ventures think about the business models around setting up other people to be the entrepreneurs and that that's one yeah. way i think we can solve bigger problems yeah, that's fantastic. Well, you're a great example of that, and we just uh, really appreciate hearing your story and, and thanking you for your time uh, today on the Agents of Innovation podcast. Thank you, Francisco. Great talking. Thank you.